Moving right along, our next presenter, um, Lester Schaumburger, is just fabulous. He is out of the extension at Virginia Tech, and he is going to chat with us about um, food safety, some of the trainings that they do, the updates on the, all the fact sheets that they have, their food processor program, acidified products, everything that they do that um, has to do with farmer's markets. So Lester, take it away. Great. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear and see me okay? I can. Okay, great. Um, as I get started into the presentation, and again, I'm going to talk about some <clears throat> extension resources that we have through Virginia Cooperative Extension for farmers markets. Um, I want to ask in the chat an, an easy yes or no. Yes or no. I know my local extension agent, or I know one of my local extension agents. Yes. Yes. Nope. Okay. We're going to talk about that. Yes. Wonderful. And I also know we have a couple of extension agents on the webinar. So if you are an extension agent, you certainly know an extension agent. Within Virginia, we have Virginia Cooperative Extension. The role of Virginia Cooperative Extension is to transfer the expertise that we have at Virginia Tech and Virginia State University to Virginia's communities. We do this through faculty specialists like myself. We do that with regional or local extension agents, which many of you look like you know your local or regional agent, uh, program assistants, and, and volunteers. And we do this in collaboration with local, state, and federal governments. We also do this in collaboration with uh, uh, industry associations. We do this in collaboration with FAFMA. So we work in partnership with many different organizations. Within Virginia, we have presence across our Commonwealth. Um, what I want for you to take away from this map is if you're in Virginia, there is an extension office that is available to support you. Um, I know we also have people on the call who are not in Virginia, and I would feel confident in telling you that it would be a similar situation within your particular state. So the the main message that I want for you to take home from my portion of, of, of today is to get to know your local extension agent. If you are in Virginia and you do not know who or where your, who your local extension agent is or where their office is, you can find that in the link that I just put in the chat. So from a food safety perspective, and I'll also say Virginia Cooperative Extension offers support beyond food safety. But from a food safety perspective, we offer a variety of trainings that are designed for vendors, for market managers. We also put out a number of fact sheets, some of which have been referenced throughout the day, as well as online trainings uh, and, and some volunteer programs. If you are interested in seeing what kinds of, of programs you might be able to sign up for, you can do that at this link. And if you're interested in perusing some of our fact sheets and recorded webinars and other publications, you can do that at the link I just put in the chat. So the first program that I want to talk about is our Enhancing the Safety of Locally Grown Produce program. We talked earlier about required trainings if you are a farm and you are covered under the produce safety rule. Um, if you are operating a farm that is not covered under the produce safety rule, there's still value to you completing some kind of food safety related training. And the Enhancing the Safety of Locally Grown Produce program can, can, can help you learn this material. We cover a lot of the same topics. Oh, thank you for saying that the links aren't showing because I'm a panelist. I've been sending links to panelists and that means you all can't see them. Um, while I keep presenting, can I ask another panelist or presenter to copy what I've been putting in the chat? Oh, I'll, good. I'll be better. Let me change that right now. Thank you. Um, with our Enhancing the Safety of Locally Grown Produce program, we cover for farmers and produce vendors, generally oh, food safety on the farm. We talk about land use, we're gonna talk about water use, manure and soil amendments, hygiene, health and training, uh, toilet and hand washing facilities, harvesting and storage, transporting produce safely. We're gonna talk about various training and certification options, food safety at the market, 
uh, current events in terms of food safety, and then also cover some other ad additional resources. We've also got some materials that are specific for market managers. So having a, a self-review checklist that a market manager could go through to identify some, some opportunities to enhance food safety at the market. And similarly, uh, uh, talking about food safety at the market. The other thing that I have heard about this program is it is a great stepping stone. So, so if you are operating a farm and you are operating a, a business and you want to grow your business, starting here with enhancing the safety of locally grown produce gives you a base level of knowledge that you'll then build upon when you reach the threshold to have to go through the Produce Safety Alliances training, or if you're considering going through a gap audit process. So we offer information through this program through fact sheets. So like this one that you see on the screen related to uh, farm worker toilet and hand washing facilities. And if you want to go and download these publications and other related publications, you can do that at this link, which I'm sharing with everyone. With this program, especially for farmers and farmers market produce vendors, we offer an online training that you can go through to, to cover all of the material that I just described. And at the end of that training, you will receive a certificate documenting that you completed that training. Now, again, this program does not meet the requirements if you are covered under the produce safety rule, but it is something if you're not covered that you could show your market manager to say, hey, look, I went through, I went through this food safety training. If you are interested in registering for this program, you can do that at this link. So let's say you are covered under the FISMA produce safety rule. And we've already talked about this earlier, so I'm not going to give it quite as much time. Um, Virginia Cooperative Extension partners with VDAX to be able to offer Produce Safety Alliance grower trainings. Our upcoming class is March 28th and 29th. The registration, as I understand it, is currently full, but if you go to the um, website, which I'll share in a moment, you can request more information. We offer these trainings year round. If you want to know more, about being covered or just generally about the produce safety rule, we have a publication for that. Um, we've also talked about some flow charts and some various ways to figure out, am I covered under the produce safety rule? Well, we have a short survey that you can also fill out to help you go through sort of like a decision tree process of, am I covered or not? So like I said, we have a class coming up. I'll share that link again. But I recognize the date might not work for everybody. You might not be in Virginia. For various reasons, this might not work for you. Well, you can also look at a whole list from the Produce Safety Alliance of all of the upcoming trainings that might work for you and your schedule uh, and, and, and whatever it is that you might need. The other thing that I want to highlight that was again talked about earlier is uh, our on-farm readiness review program. So this is really meant to assist a uh, covered farm to, to become prepared for uh, an inspection or to gauge their preparedness for an inspection. And this is something that you can work with your local extension agent to do, and which is why if you go back to some of the links I shared earlier, develop a relationship with your local extension agent. So a lot of the trainings that we have talked about today, a lot of the trainings that are out there are really designed for someone who's in charge or someone who's a manager. But one of the things that I firmly believe is that food safety is a shared responsibility. Every single person who's handling food as part of your operation has a responsibility for food safety. And so one of the things that we offer through Virginia Cooperative Extension is a training for farm employees. It is a short online training that people can register for at this link. So now I'm gonna talk about a, a related program. So a program that we like to call Enhancing the Safety of Locally Prepared Foods. Um, and, and this one, uh, for those of you who have been around for a minute and know Joelle Eifert, she was integral in putting these resources together. Um, we have created a series of fact sheets 
designed for value-added food producers to, un to understand what do I need to know to sell jams and jellies at the market? Oops. What do I need to know? I'm going too far ahead. What do I need to know in order to sell refrigerated and frozen meals at the market, et cetera? Um, these publications can be found at this link. And one of the things that I really want to highlight about these publications is we're consistently looking to create new ones based on popular products. So we talked about kefir water earlier. We talked about elderberry syrup. Um, how we're thinking about how can we put out additional fact sheets to, to address some of these topics. So as you have them, if you tell your local extension agent, if you tell Kim, someone will, will let us know and we can work to get resources out to you and into your community. Something else that I want to highlight includes our going to market publication. Um, it's something that's been referenced throughout the day and I'm gonna put the link to that right here. This is meant to be a little, little booklet that can really succinctly cover what you might need to know or some requirements about selling particular products at the market. Um, it is currently available. I will also let you know that we're working on a revised and expanded version of this publication. So once that is available, um, we will work to, to share that, that it's out there so you can get the most up-to-date information. Here's an example of what some of these publications look like. So talking about providing samples, honey came up earlier. What do I need to know to sell honey at the farmer's market? And what do I need to know to sell refrigerated dips, spreads, dressings, and salads, or sell kombucha? So we want, we want the goal of these publications is for them to be, to be really digestible and actionable for you. Something else that's come up uh, at other points in the day is our Food Producer Technical Assistance Network. Again, if you've been around for a minute, you knew this program as the Food Innovations Program. We've gone through a bit of a, a, a rebrand. We are now the Food Producer Technical Assistance Network uh, under the leadership of Melissa Wright, who, who's the program director. If you want to know more about that program, I'm going to put the website in the chat. But real quick, the goal of the, of, the, of the network is to be able to, one, provide testing of food products for safety and quality, to provide guidance on reformulation and product design, to provide product label review for completeness in accuracy, and also to support creating nutrition facts panel graphics. If you are a, a manager who's working with vendors, or if you're a vendor yourself, and you're interested in working with the network, you can either request an evaluation at this link, or you can contact Melissa directly at foodbiz at vt.edu. Some other pieces to highlight about the network are how they support uh, food businesses in their regulatory compliance. So updating and training on the impact of uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, working with network clients of, of potential state or federal regulatory issues for the products that they're trying to, to prepare. Um, also acting as an acidified food processing authority, so providing clients with, with an FDA compliant scheduled process. And also, again, connecting the expertise that we have at Virginia Tech and Virginia State, understanding the science behind our food regulations and, and why we're doing what we're doing. Something that's also come up today is the need for some vendors, especially our food establishment vendors, to be or have someone that is a certified food protection manager. Virginia Cooperative Extension can support you in earning this certification. We deliver the SurfSafe program. If you or any of your vendors are interested in taking the program, they can find a class near them at the link I just put in the chat and register. Um, this is also a training that might be applicable to home-based home food processing operations. Um, it's also a program that we are now offering in Spanish. Um, so you'll see that on, on the registration page. And if you have vendors or you know of people trying to take the class in other languages, there's a process that we can go through to try and work with a translator. So we, we wanna make it work.
some markets uh, may have vendors that want to sell seafood. And we have a muscle food safety specialist with Virginia Cooperative Extension who is housed in Hampton, Virginia at our Seafood Ag and Extension, uh, Ag Research and Extension Center. Her name is Dr. Catherine Parga. And she delivers the seafood HACCP program. Uh, she co-delivers the seafood HACCP program. There's a basic seafood HACCP program. It's a three-day in-person class that there's actually that's, there's one that's scheduled in Hampton. Um, there's also uh, the, a, a second segment of this program that is a one-day virtual option that is available at other points in the year. I unfortunately don't have a quick link to share about this one, but I can follow up with, with a link or some more information about how to, how to get connected to this program. Also related uh, from Dr. Parga is, is HACCP, meat and poultry HACCP and siluriforms. I had to, to pause and say that correctly, um, or catfish. Um, and so she is available to help people or operations obtain a meat and poultry HACCP certification or go or create a meat and poultry HACCP plan um, and also has information about how to how to earn a grant of inspection or go through the grant of inspection process and complying with with USDA and, and FSIS. I want to highlight two extension volunteer programs that might be of interest to you, especially to the market managers who are out there. The first one is related to our Virginia Cooperative Extension Master Gardeners. Now, our Master Gardeners are volunteers who are trained by Virginia Cooperative Extension to deliver gardening-related program. It's in the name. Um, we have got local and regional Master Gardener chapters throughout the Commonwealth. And one way that this might be particularly relevant for a farmer's market is there are a number of Master Gardener chapters that will have booths uh, at farmer's markets to collect produce for donation. So they might accept donation from individuals at the market who maybe buy extra and want to donate it, but also they'll hang around after the market. And if there are any vendors who don't want to take back what they didn't sell, they can donate it there in the moment and the Master Gardeners will work to distribute that in the local community. The second master volunteer program that I want to highlight are our master food volunteers. So these are trained volunteers um, who can deliver food demonstrations and other health related programs at the market. And so for both master gardeners and master food volunteers, your, your first point to ask questions about, hey, could we could we have master gardeners and master food volunteers at our market would be your local agent to see if they have those programs. Oh, and I did not. I'm going to go back because I had links that I didn't share. Here's for master gardeners. Here's for master food volunteers. And this is Dr. Parga's email address. Oh, great. Thanks, Kim. On the same wavelength. Um, all right. So with that, any questions about Virginia Cooperative Extension resources and support? Well, we do have some questions. Do you want to wait until you're, do you want me to just start? No, I, I sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, does the training meet requirements for food manufacturer training required by VDEX? I wonder which training that is in reference to, because I talked about a couple of different ones. Yeah, this was. Um, so what I, what I would, I would probably reference whatever guidance is coming from VDAX in terms of what trainings they need. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if it is something that we are able to offer. So, so to give you an example, um, we offer the Produce Safety Alliance's grower training, and that is the recognized training for growers who are covered under the Produce Safety Alliance Produce Safety Rule, or sorry, they're covered under the FISMA Produce Safety Rule. Um, in terms of other trainings, I don't know. Um, Michael, if you send me a message in the chat, I'd be glad to, to try and work through that more specifically with you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to skip the sheets that we want until the end because I've got a whole list. Um, how is the VCE Serve Safe Certification Food Protection Program different than the 360 Food Manager course? Do we need both or either? I'm unfamiliar with the 360 course. I wonder if there's anyone from, from VDH on here who can speak to that more, more than I can. Um, 
I, I think if it is a certification that that if if it, if somebody can earn that certification and be a certified food protection manager, then I then they would be comparable. But oh yeah, so that for yes. our department, you can use that. I don't yeah. worry. It's it is the same basic certification, but I'll let Perry answer more. No, you're exactly right, Jessica. Um, yeah, it was one of the six um, classes that I showed on my slide, and that is an acceptable That's right. um, cer certificate under VDH. Yeah, so those, those six courses that are listed on our website and included in the resources um, are all um, approved certified food protection manager courses. And 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 I can understand from from a food business's perspective to 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 participate in the course that makes the most sense for them. We in Virginia Cooperative Extension just we have adopted Surf Safe, so that is the one that we offer. But yes, there are multiple options. Okay, what is HACCP stand for? Oh, sorry, I made a note of that and I didn't even pass up. It stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point. And, and it is a way to organize a, a food processing process or the way that the way in which you will process your food to consider what hazards exist in, in that process or, or there's the potential for those hazards to exist. And what are the ways in which you will control for those hazards at critical control points throughout that process? Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I said that. We've been quickly looking up on the back end and acronyms <laughs> all day. Uh, yeah. We need to remember to ask our experts to speak in our common language. Um, Michael said it was the food protection management and practices um, training. He wants to know if that meets the requirements for, um, if your training meets the requirements for that that's required by VDEX. Um, I think it depends on, on what, what you are producing. Um, my reference for that with, with the certified food protection manager, let me go back to that slide and try and find that. I found that it as it was referenced in the home-based food operation application and how-to document. Um, but for others, I, I would look to somebody from VDEX to answer that better than I can. Okay. Anyone from VDEX? Megan, Pam? I was going to ask Megan. I'm sorry, I missed the question. So Megan, I don't know if you heard it or Jess. I missed the question too. I was. Can you repeat videos. the question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so in the in the in the at in the home based food processing operation application and how to yes. document one of the uh -huh. one of the trainings that's mentioned is is earning the certified food protection manager certification. And so okay. we offer Serve Safe. And so I think the question is, if somebody goes through Serve Safe, would they? Meet the require meet that requirement. Yes, they do meet the the training requirement under twenty one CFR one seventeen with a serve safe certification. Um, I know there are uh, there are different levels of serve safe. Right, there is a food handler and a food manager offered under that program. Yep. Um, typically, the manager course is what's needed. Um, in some very limited instances, on a case by case basis, the handler course is sufficient. But it really depends on what they're doing. Um, it has to be a pretty low risk food product for that. And as we just highlighted, Serve Safe is not your only option. It's just right. the option that we offer. It is an option. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Somebody's asking about freshwater fish at the markets, what the process is for selling that. I would, again, I, I would defer to our regulatory partners yeah. on, on the webinar. But I can also pass this back to, to Dr. Pariga. Pam and Megan, do you have any comments? I know that I, I was also looking for this earlier and y'all were reaching out to get the answer. So we may need to circle back to that one. Yeah. Um, we've got a question where um, one of the attendees is curious about from each of the authorities about the cases where reusable containers can be used for produce and packaged foods. Are there certain materials that are acceptable or sanitation guidelines for reuse? I mean, I know we can reuse egg cartons under certain parameters. 
I'll go back to my technical specialist <laughs> with what they tell <laughs> yeah. Maggot and Jeff. Yeah. Again, like you said, the eight cartons, but I don't. I don't know about others. So the question, Megan and Jess, is what um, what is the parameters around reusing containers for produce and packaged foods? Are there certain materials that are acceptable or sanitation guidelines for reuse? Pam, you want to address what the guidelines are for egg cartons? I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm yeah, just... sorry. I mean, no, they can reuse the egg cartons, but they have to be clean and they have to make sure they're properly labeled. I mean, you can't have another company that's on there, you know what I'm saying? You have a food lion carton, but the eggs are not from food lion. So they have to be properly labeled and they have to be clean, but there have been reused egg cartons. Okay. Yeah, and for other types of reusables, um, <clears throat> kind of what we currently deal with that is when people bring growlers back into breweries for refill. And we require that those are cleaned and sanitized by the facility. Um, before being refilled and provided to the customer. Um, I'm not quite sure how that would work in a farmer's market setting, um, but right now I'm going to say that is the process that we would look for them to follow. Okay. And we also do that with um, like your, your olive oil um, businesses where you yeah. purchase olive oil, then you take back your empty container and it gets refilled there. You know, the business is required to, to wash those. Well, I see people bringing back honey jars all the time too to the honey folks. And so, I mean, in glass, I would assume that they can take those, but probably not plastic, right? right. Um, all right. So, I have to, go ahead. Oh, I was going to add for produce. So, produce is going to be, you know, the wash, rinse, and sanitize, like if you're covered by the rules. So, like, um, we see that quite a bit for like a you pick operation for strawberries, for instance. And this year, strawberry growers, I've seen quite a few of them reusing the baskets that the pickers will take the baskets home, bring them back, get a, maybe a dollar return or something on them. And then the farmer will wash, rinse and sanitize on those baskets or maybe the RPCs. Those are the reusable plastic containers. And they maybe will also be reusing um, cardboard containers. And they'll just, as long as they're just clean or maybe, you know, put a liner in them, they use those as well. It's just, they can do reusables, but it's again, on covered farms that we're inspecting them. Okay, thank you. I had another question um, is if we are already a nutritionist, do we need to do train? Oops, I lost it. Oh, I just, sorry, that was me. I just responded to it. It's if you're a nutritionist, you still need to go through training. And I, I appreciate the question. Um, yes, so our master food volunteers do receive training in nutrition. They have to complete a 30 hour training program. Part of that training covers nutrition, but it also covers uh, food safety, food preparation, um, volunteer best practices, risk management. Um, so, so if you are a nutritionist, you would certainly have a leg up, but we would have some extra stuff that we'd want to train you on. Oh, thank you. I have one more question. Is the food management certification, Lester, that you explained what the acronym was required on the Department of Ag app? In parentheses, it says hazards, et cetera. It's the last question. Mm-hmm. Do you know? I would want to. I would want to take a look at the application that they're that they're referencing in particular first before I answer that question. Okay, so we'll do that as a follow up, yeah. and um, let you know. Are there any last questions? Because we've got VDAX, VDH, and VCE, and we've got like a couple of minutes left to ask any questions. I know somebody put in here and I didn't see anybody answered it. I don't know if it's because we need to go and check on it or not. Um, along the lines of selling animals, where could I find regulations for selling composting worms and or uh, castings? I don't even know who that falls under. Crickets, maybe this is why it wasn't answered. <laughs> Did, is it, would that be Department of Agriculture? I'm gonna take a little stab at it. It might be completely wrong, but I'll tell you from pretty safety rule, if a farmer does use their own composting, then they would have to, this is just like a going to be a roundabout answer, but they use their own composting on the farm, then there's a composting log that they would have to use. And we asked to see that log of just their turning their temperatures. And if they use compost that another farm sells to them, you know, and they can, another farm can make it, they have to have that certificate of compliance and that it's inspected. So they do get an inspection 
how that shifted with compliance. And I believe I, I just was at a farm last week and they said they got that certificate of compliance from the USDA. So we have looked into it. I'm just throwing that out there, you know, because we get that question a lot. Can I use my own compost on farms? If, you know, you, you definitely can. But um, I do know that there is a certificate of compliance, you know, that we do look at when we're on farms for the composting. Didn't yeah. quite answer it, but we'll definitely... See if we can find an answer for that. I appreciate that. I mean, then we've had several questions about freeze dried products and what the regs are for um, selling freeze dried products. Uh, does VDAX have any specific rules for freeze dried products when working under their exemptions, or do the same rules apply? Emma, I want to turn that, Megan. I don't know if you're still listening, but I'd like to turn that over to Megan or Jess. I don't know if they've worked with that recently. Sorry. I'm, oh, go ahead, Jess. Well, I was just going to say, I have done a business with it, but they were under inspection, and I do not think freeze drying is going to fall under our exemptions. Okay. Yeah, that's all I was going to say, too. Um, potentially, so our exemption is very specific, um, and we really don't go outside of the wording. Um, I feel like one thing we get a lot of questions on, for example, is freeze-dried candy because candy itself is listed as a low-risk food. Um, but currently, our current understanding, uh, we don't go outside of that. So we do not allow freeze-dried candy, for example, um, under the uh, exemption. So they would need an inspection to do a product like that. Um, there are some very specific products listed under the exemption, such as uh, dried fruit, dry herbs, dry seasoning, dry mixtures. Um, so if they have a question on one of those specific products that are already listed as a dried product, um, in the exemption, I would encourage them to send an email to food safety and we'll just make sure everything looks okay to operate under the exemption. Um, so that's pretty much all I had to add on freeze dried food products. And then the last wrap for Lester, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, Lester, we have, you and I have already talked about doing a specific um, going to market form for elderberry syrup and tinctures, mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. we get lots of information on that. Mm -hmm. um, we also have had folks that have requested for freeze-dried products because we get mm -hmm. a lot of questions about that mm -hmm. and microgreens, which is mm -hmm. a little bit different than others. Yeah. So yeah. those are the, the ones that we're constantly getting questions on. I've added, I've added those to the list that we're already working off of. So I saw, I saw some of that in chat. And if I can take just 30 seconds, I want to highlight a comment that I saw in the chat from, from a current master gardener um, talking about, so I, I referenced it in relation to farmers markets and having master gardeners at the markets to get food. There are also master gardeners who will, who will do gleaning uh, on farms. And so it's also relevant if you are a farmer and you're interested in donating anything that you might not have harvested or you harvested more, you have more you know, bounty, um, you can work with master gardeners to get that donated too. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and our food banks are working on that at a lot of the markets also. Um, there's a labeling question. Does microgreens need a certain type of labeling? Pam, Megan. I would turn that over to Christina or Megan. Christina. <laughs> okay. Christina. You're loving being able to say that, aren't you? Ms. I love it. This is great. Isn't it? I normally can't say that. Can I? Can this great? <laughs> Christina. So microgreens definitely is going to be one of the covered produce that we inspect. We inspect microgreen farms. And then we just are going to follow the labeling rule that you saw of the VDAX. You know, it's going to have to, anything that's going to be at the farmer's market is going to have to follow that label rule. So definitely, if, you know, if you're selling microgreens and like maybe the clamshells, then you'll have to label it. Um, if you're selling it in bulk, it just depends on how you're selling it. Um, but it is definitely going to be one of our covered crops. It's, it's, it's just going to have to follow that decision tree. And I hate to, you know, keep putting you back on that decision tree, but you know, it's just first question is, are you selling a cover crop? And it'd be, yes, that'd be a cover crop. And then um, it, it would be the amount, about how much dollar amount. So then, but then you would definitely, all of the produce that we inspect has to follow the labeling law. You're saying microgreens that are sold live in soil also have to fall under that? If it's in a clamshell. So some people will keep it and put it in those tiny little clamshells and sell it in separate little soil containers like that, yes. So it'll just still be labeled and, and complete, you know, and what it is. 
And then one of the final questions, which came from earlier, and I'm sorry if I missed y'all answering it, was about, um, are you able to sell fishing worms at a market, at a farmer's market? I will say, I don't know the answer to that, Kim, but we can work to get an answer. I don't know. And that. Maybe what somebody else does that's on here, but, but I don't. And I was going to tell you, Kim, with the questions, and I think you all said that, that, are, that you did not receive answers for. Mm -hmm. You can send them to us and we'll work in with everybody to get those answers for you. We appreciate that. We will certainly had some hatching eggs, but some other other things during the right. pandemic. And we've had somebody ask the question, um, Pam, during uh, back to COVID. I know we all want to kind of just like forget about COVID, but the mm -hmm. gracious exemption that VDAX gave us so that um, regarding the online exemption during COVID that we could do online and have it distributed at a farmer's market during COVID. And then mm -hmm. we ended that when the state of emergency was lifted. Do mm -hmm. you have, um, so the person is asking for, is there any documentation of that? I know it was officially rescinded when the state of emergency was lifted, but no. We put it out yeah. continuously through right. our sources, but right, right. There has not been official documentation. And then uh, Megan and I were talking in an email earlier. I, I, we want to go back and look at that, and we'll get back with you. Okay. The language in our law, but we will, yeah. we will get back with you on that. I appreciate that. And um, the local health department. Somebody was told that freeze dried would be the same as dried products, um, because and it doesn't. I guess the approved list doesn't specify what dried means. So. You could add the freeze dried question to your list of things. We will we'll look at that. Um, so I, we could keep them on here all day, but boy, they've been gracious to be on here with us three quarters of the day. So I want to say thank you. There are two things that have come up that are not food safety, but they're things that are relevant to all of you that are on this call that I want to mention. You probably have seen it in our social media and in all of our emails, but it came up when we had a meeting with the fire marshal. And so I just wanted to put it out there while everybody is here that at a farmer's market, your um, the Virginia State Fire Code says that you have to have a 20 foot clearance around your cooking tent. So your guys that are doing cooking sausage biscuits or crab cakes, et cetera, they need to be segregated 20 feet away from the other tents that are at a farmer's market. What we have been told is, um, and it's written kind of nebulously into the fire code, and we have all of that clearly outlined on our website, as well as what the codes are and where you can find it in the code. But you can bunch all of your cooking tents together and then have them segregated. So look at that and make sure that your market is adhering to the fire code. Um, you also have to have chocks under the food truck tires, which is new. And then the last thing that has come up is not food safety per se, but it's that all your vendors at your markets have to be, when they are collecting sales tax, the sales tax has to be set, shown on this receipt separately. It cannot be bunched together. The tax code requires, let me see if I can read it for you. The um, tax code requires that sales tax must be separated from the cost of goods and shown as a line item on a customer receipt, as well as in the vendor's records. Otherwise, the sale shows up as gross sales and there's no way for the vendor to file accurate returns. It's also part of um, regarding if a customer needs to have a refund, it's necessary for the vendor to be able to distinguish between the actual cost of the item and the tax. So you've got state taxes and you have local taxes and they need to be segregated. Um, they need to be segregated out on the receipt. There is a tax code. We will be sending all of this out. This has come up as we've been doing vendor kickoffs. I know a lot of vendors will say it's $4 and we've included the tax information in there. That's not acceptable. That's in violation of the tax code. So just to reiterate, um, you need to have your taxes separated, the cost of goods, and then you have to have line items showing what your separate taxes are in your area where you are selling. All right. So that was the it for um, what if they don't give paper receipts? then if you're using square or something of that sort, it needs to be segregated, okay? Um, so I we will put the IRS information out there in the tax code so that you can see. I know a lot of markets don't even give receipts at all um, and they work on and they do cash and things of that sort. But bottom line is you've got to be able to show your um, sales tax, okay? Um, 
Also, I want to thank everybody that was on the call, all of our presenters from Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, the Extension. Uh, this has been a fabulous day and I'm so excited that y'all were able to be with us. I can't thank you enough for participating. I'd also like to thank all of the folks that have joined us and spent the day with us. You have the, um, the link in the, the Q&A as well as in the chat box that you need to go ahead and um, click on and download so that you can get your certificate of participation. And today uh, we will be sending out, we hope by Wednesday, the link that has all of the videos from today, they'll be segregated out by sections as well as we'll have the resources. It may take us a little longer to get the answers to the questions, but we will be sending those out as a follow-up also. So look for those in your email. Um, for you guys that are not on our, I will just shamelessly plug, please sign up on our, our newsletter because we're constantly putting any new information that we find out from VDEX or from Department of Health or the Extension. We are pushing it out as fast as we can to everybody in the community. So sign up for our newsletter. And um, Mary is going to drop that in the chat one final time. If you have any final food safety questions that you didn't get into the chat box today, please email that to us at info at vafma.org. Mary will drop that in the chat box and we will include that in the list of um, questions that we send over to our presenters. We will have all questions. Um, we will uh, have the cutoff for all questions um, to be Monday so that we can get all of that information collected. So thank you all. And I really appreciate your being here with us today. I think it was very successful for our, our first ever statewide food safety summit. Yay! And Pam, congratulations on your promotion. And Perry, congratulations on your retirement, your, your last big hoorah before you retire. And, uh, and all of the new folks that have come on and are working in this area. And Lester, thank you so much for, as always, answering our emails. Glad to. I, I, I appreciate them. And like I said, we try and turn them into fact sheets or other, other forms of outreach. So keep them coming. Yeah, we will. Um, yeah, I see somebody says that Square also does the tax. Yeah, so if you're using Square, you're using PayPal, Venmo, you're using um, any of those types of mechanisms, um, uh, you are, you're good to go. The answer to the question around them being bunched together, that was from us talking to the, the um, fire marshal. He said that they could be bunched together. Um, in a 90 foot area and um, and then you need to have to have the segregation and it was actually your specific fire marshal that told us that we could do that so um, for the the West End market so but they do need to be segregated there was a incident at the uh, it was one of the big festivals that was in Ashland I don't know if it was the watermelon festival or the berry festival or something where there was a fire and so um, they're cracking down on this is not a new code, but they're definitely paying attention to it. So make sure that you guys are um, safe out there. Thank you all. And uh, we will end this. So I would like to uh, say a special thanks to all of our partners. Again, the Virginia Department of Health, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Family, Virginia Family Nutrition Program, as well as the USDA, FMPP, Farm Credit, VSU College of Agriculture, Prince Charitable Trust, Virginia Fresh Match, and the Virginia's for Farmers Market Lovers Trail and Virginia's for Farmers Market Lovers. We thank you.